My name is Myrna Skolny, and this is yet another video in my series on early Staffordshire pottery figures, figures like those on these shelves. These figures were made before 1840, and many are now over 200 years old. They reveal a world we couldn't otherwise see because photography had not yet been introduced commercially, and printed pictures were for the relatively affluent. In short, the average person in that era saw fewer images in a lifetime than you or I might see in a morning. My theme today focuses on figures depicting love, marriage, and family, and it all starts with that eternal emotion, lust. And I'm stretching the definition of figure to include an unlikely object, this splendid large plaque. To my mind, it's a figural form too, because the flirtatious lady and the sailor eyeing her are molded in extraordinarily high relief. Collectors know this plaque as Patricia and her lover, but it could well be dubbed seduction. This print inspired it, and the man's striped pants tell he's a sailor. It's titled Jack on a Cruise, Avast There, Back Your Main Top Sail. Avast is a nautical term for stop, and the main sail in this instance is her billowing skirt. The potter Ralph Wood made this plaque in the 1780s, but her teasing, his yearning, and the dog's playfulness are age-old emotions that bring to life an object made centuries ago. This awesome plaque is one of my favourite pieces of English pottery. Despite its size, it's very light because it's so thinly potted. The front is decorated with coloured glazes, and the back is unglazed but coated with centuries of grime accumulated in rooms heated by coal fires. Courtship rituals in those days were very different, and for the better classes, courtship was a serious business negotiation. In this charming group, an eager swain offers a ring to his lady, but both she and her spaniel look away. This group has a sizable footprint, and collectors who've only seen pictures of it are breathtaking when they view it in the flesh for the very first time. Notice the crisply modelled bench. Like all the other early figure groups we'll see today, much attention was paid to making the back look pretty too. This model is known as persuasion, and occasionally one has a title tablet on the base, as you see here, persuasion being spelt with a W rather than a U. Spelling, as you'll see, was not a strong point in the potteries then. This is the same model, but with a different bocage. Again, another bocage. And here, the base has acquired feet. The differences in the groups are small, but each has its own distinct personality. Jane Austen published her novel Persuasion in 1818, and for a long time collectors thought it inspired these figure groups. Rather, the inspiration was the print on the right titled Persuasion, which was published nine years earlier. Clearly the figures are reversed, but even the bench is the same, and I'd like to think that a Staffordshire figure group inspired Jane Austen. This courtship group is a jolly one, so I surmise we'd move down the social scale a little. It's titled Courtship, and the potter John Dale made it and marked it. The Sherrod Pot Bank made this similar model. Sherrod's figures are from the same moulds that Dale used, but now her hand has been placed familiarly on his thigh, so this clearly wasn't a chaperoned event. Other potters also made this courtship group, again, as you see, apparently from the same moulds. But, as is so often the case with early figures, I can't confidently attribute this colourful example to any particular potter. Courtship wasn't only for the young. In those days of high maternal mortality, a widower left with a brood of children hastily sought a replacement, and for many an elderly spinster, matrimony provided a welcome alternative to loneliness and poverty. Here an older couple is seated on a bench, and again he offers a ring. This rare group is also known as courtship, and occasionally one is titled courtship on its base. Sherrod made it, and like the persuasion groups we saw earlier, it's a collector's favourite. But for lucky couples, true love did exist. This little courtship group shows a gallant gentleman offering garlands to his lady, surely a nod to the existence of romantic love. Another glimpse of an everyday scene, a rather ordinary couple, arm in arm. This elderly couple, clutched in a steamy embrace, attests to the existence of passion into old age. 
notice that in the heat of the moment her shoe falls to the ground. This group was made sometimes without a bocage, and here you can't miss her discarded red shoe and those thick grandmotherly socks. Well, after love comes marriage, but wedding rituals and regulations were very different in those days. In this print of circa 1790, titled Gretna Green or the Red Hot Marriage, a blacksmith marries a couple at his angle in the Scottish town of Gretna Green, and the same scene is on these plaques. England then had very rigorous marriage laws, so those wanting a quick workaround instead fled to Scotland. Here anyone could marry them, and it so happened that Gretna Green was the first village across the Scottish border on a major road, and the blacksmith's shop on its outskirts was a convenient stopping point for those in haste. This charming Gretna Green wedding is titled Wedding. The blacksmith officiates at his anvil, and the romantic notion was that because he forged hot metal, he also forged binding unions. The bride doesn't wear a white dress because white wedding dresses were not yet in vogue, but she would have worn her best dress, perhaps a new one if she could afford it. Sherrick made this group, and he also made it on a range of other bases. Here it's on a slightly smaller base. And this unusual example, again Sherrod, has a trumpet-shaped vase behind it. This anvil wedding has a plaque attached reading, John MacDonald, age 79, a Scotch esquire, run off with our English girl, age 17, to Gratnall Green, the old blacksmith, to be married. The plaque poked fun at the elderly Lord Erskine, who in 1818 eloped to Gretna Green with Sarah Buck, his young housekeeper, and their three illegitimate children. The story gets better, and it's depicted in the satirical Crookshank print of 1819. To avoid his legitimate children, who wanted to stop a marriage that jeopardized their inheritance, Lord Erskine allegedly traveled disguised in what were described as female clothes with a leghorn bonnet and veil, and we see him dressed thus here. Lord Erskine wasn't just anyone. He was the Lord Chancellor of Great Britain, the greatest legal mind of his day, and his hot-headed elopement stunned the nation. So, of course, Staffordshire Potters couldn't resist poking fun in clay. This group has a companion group showing a more run-of-the-mill wedding, and here the two groups are side by side. In the conventional wedding, the bride, again not in a white dress, stands with the groom before a parson, while the little clerk comically beseeches the heaven's blessings. The attached plaque tells that the group commemorates the passage of the New Marriage Act of 1823. Before that, it was easy to fall foul of the persnickety requirements of the marriage law, and either party could use that violation to procure an annulment, even decades later. But annulment had disastrous consequences for children who suddenly found themselves illegitimate. Enter the Marriage Act of 1823, which made it impossible to annul a marriage because of a petty violation. The plaque reads, the new marriage act, John Frill and Anne Boak, age 21, that is right, says the parson, amen, says the clerk. In other words, whatever the true age of either John or Anne, who claimed to be 21 and thus of marrying age, they were married. There was no going back. Moulds for figure groups like these were complex and costly, and potters were adept at putting them to further use. Moulds for the couple marrying at the anvil were also used to make this charming little group on the right. As you see, the moulds for the vicar in this new marriage act group were also used to make a little freestanding figure of a vicar. The moulds for the couple were also put to use to fashion this petite group. And in the same spirit, those moulds were reworked to place the couple the other way round. I like to think one was intended as courtship, the other as marriage, but who knows. This is a somewhat larger New Marriage Act group, again with the same words on the plaque. Note the bride and groom's rather grim, determined expressions, and how her finger is stretched out expectantly. Miraculously, it has not snapped off in 200 years. I never cease to be amazed at how engaging Staffordshire pottery figures can be and how each has its own personality. The figures seem so very human. This new marriage act, complete with plaque, is set in an arbour and again the figure's faces ooze individuality. 
This group was reproduced from the late 19th century onwards, but bland expressions, lack of detail, and a somewhat different color palette always betray reproductions for what they really are. Here you see a reproduction to the right, and it doesn't take an expert to detect its poor modeling, a sort of molten look, while other finer points of difference are evident to the even half-trained eye. If you think it can't get worse, it can, and this ugly blue and white object too is a reproduction. Marriage brings with it pluses and minuses, and the potter Ralph would convey that notion in this allegorical group known as liberty and matrimony. The bird on her hand represents liberty. The cage he holds symbolizes the restraints of marriage. Wood experimented with various bodies, and this beauty, made around 1790, has a rather porcelain-like body. He also made it with a typical pottery body, along with a companion group of a shepherd and shepherdess, as you see here. These Ralph Wood groups, like most of the figures we've looked at, are decorated with enamel colours that were painted on over a clear glaze. I find the creamy, soft enamels on the earliest figures particularly beautiful. Wood also made this pair and decorated them by simply colouring the glazes. This technique, with its limited colour palette, was displaced by a broad range of prettier enamel colours by the end of the 1700s. Believe it or not, England had no divorce law until late in the 19th century. Before then, there was no escaping a miserable marriage, so the battle for the breaches raged unabated in many a household, as seen in this print by Richard Newton. This rare Staffordshire group symbolises the inescapable matrimonial turmoil of those times. As the husband and wife tussle for control of the breaches, even their small cat flees from their wrath. It has two amusing and typically misspelt impressions. Who shall wear the breeches on the left and on the right impressed into the clay but not painted the words conquer or die. It is a pointed reminder that death generally provided the only release from a miserable marriage. Among the happy consequences of marriage are children. We think that Staffordshire pottery cradles were given as christening gifts. Some, like these, are empty, but most usually hold an infant and they come in a range of sizes. The little cradle on the left was made in Devon rather than Staffordshire, and it's unusual in that the brown colouring was applied as liquid brown clay. The other three have enamels painted on top of the glaze. These cradles were decorated with colours under the glaze. This was a cheaper technique, but the colour palette was limited. In the 19th century, a christening or baptism was an important life cycle event marking the existence of what might be a very brief life. In around 1830, Sherrod made this group and it's titled Baptism of Mary, not once but twice. Notice the attendees. The vicar catches the baby rather awkwardly while his clerk looks to the heavens for mercies. The father apparently wants to be elsewhere and the two ladies are godmothers. A mother in most cases didn't attend a christening because she was expected to stay home until after her so-called churching, which was a simple afterbirth Thanksgiving ritual during a church service. This is another Sherrod christening on yet another typical Sherrod base. Christenings usually took place during church services, but a sickly babe was christened with haste because unchristened children couldn't be buried in church grounds. This is a particularly teeny christening, only five inches high, with minute restored figures, but I know of no other example, so I'm pleased it has survived to silently bear witness. This is a larger christening group, and to my knowledge, it's also unique. Here the colours were brushed on under the glaze. On the right, the parson holds the baby and his clerk is at his side, and on the left, the father appearing rather agitated, stands with the godmothers and a young child. Staffordshire Potter's fashioned heartwarming glimpses of family life. This fabulous group of circa 1820, again Sherrod, is one such example and it includes the family dog. Never one to let moulds go to waste, Sherrod often used them to create other figure groups. In this case, 
a mother and infant. And I really want to show you the back of her bocage, so crisp and almost heart-shaped. And to pair with her, of course, the father and daughter. As we'll see, figures of mothers alone with children abound, but not so figures of fathers. The only other model that comes to mind is this stunner that the potter Ralph Wood made circa 1785, and it's so rare I can show it to you only from an old photograph. It's decorated with coloured glazes, and there is a refinement to the modelling that we see infrequently in subsequent decades. In the same spirit as the Sherrick family group, an unknown part of fashion, this contented family scene, complete with both a dog and a cat. I call it the happy family. It's painted in enamel colours, as is this group, again the same couple, but now with sheep and a spool vase rather than a bocage. Copying your competitor's work was accepted practice in the potteries then, and the potter Charles Tittensaw made the happy family group on the right. Tittensaw figures are typically rather naive. Notice the mother's feet don't reach the ground, the baby seems to be floating in air and the cat's head is a mere blob. This group, like most hidden saw figures, has colours applied under the glaze. Well then, as now, mothers played a dominant role in raising children. On the right, a mother reads to her child, again with a dog, and on the left, now joined by a cat, they play pat-a-cake or some such game. Another two figures on the same theme. These aren't a pair, but they're apparently from the same pot bank, and both are titled pastime in small letters on the bases. And another two, simpler, without titles and made without bocage. This mother is reading to her child and the words Ave Maria are painted on the book. Enoch Wood probably made this figure circa 1820. Collectors call it the prudent mother because it mimics porcelain figures of that name of the sort on the right that the Derby factory made from the late 1700s. It reflects the raised awareness of the importance of reading. This is the most stunning of mother-child groups. Although it's not marked, the distinctive glorious bocage leaves tell us that the potter John Walton made it. The sight of a child riding a dog was not uncommon in that day. Dogs were used to pull children's carts and invalids' carts and even commercial merchandise. On the same theme, an unidentified potter made this simpler version. This mother is a sailor's wife and the child at her side is wearing sailor pants. Here you see another, this time made without a bocage, with her companion sailor husband beside her. Figures like these must have been immensely significant in their day, when sailors left their loved ones for years on end, not even leaving a photograph as a reminder. This figure, titled Mother and Child, brings to mind Staffordshire figures of the Virgin Mary. I love the humour in this plump mother and her lank, ungainly daughter. The title, Ma Bairn, is My Child in Scottish Dialect. The design source is this undated satirical lithograph of the 1820s, titled My Girl. A companion lithograph is titled My Boy, but I'm still looking for the figure group it may have inspired. Well, perhaps at the lower end of the social scale than previous models, we see a mother going about her everyday duties with a child on her hip. Another mother, this time with two children in tow. A mother and child, hand in hand, this one decorated in underglaze colours. And another, particularly lovely and finer than most underglaze figures. And yes, this mother really is holding a child. Some of these figures are humble little objects, quite crude, and clearly they were intended for less affluent buyers. Another in the same vein, a trifle, I know, but I like to think it was of great sentimental value to its original owner. This finely executed group titled Widow and Orphan is a sharp reminder of the harshness of life in an era of meagre wages and no social safety net. The loss of a wage earner could promptly plunge a family into the direst of poverty. 
Here the little children are gathering sticks. Old age is the final act in life cycle and several potters depicted old age as an elderly couple. Their sheer number suggests that they were popular figures in their day. Rolf Wood introduced these models in the 1780s. These are his handiwork and they decorated in colored glazes. They were made to pair, but today most survive as singles. Wood also came to decorate these models in more popular enamels, sometimes even adding bocage as was the fashion then. His figures set the look for depictions of old age and potter after potter emulated them. This pair is the only example I know of on a single base, probably made more than 30 years after Wood's death. These are titled Old Ages, while this pair is simply Old Age. Some are untitled. Some have full bocage. And some have these rather unusual lopsided bocages. The lady in this slightly shorter pair, titled Old Age, is significantly modified. She's a different model. And the same pair again, this time titled simply Age. The popularity of these figures in their day reminds us that in that era of shorter lifespans, old age was celebrated as a true achievement. Staffordshire figures also depict parents and children in biblical and classical contexts but today I have focused on figures showing family life in the pre-Victorian era. Again, I am Myrna Skolny, and you can learn more about early Staffordshire figures by reading my books. Also, my website, mystaffordshirefigures.com, provides a wealth of information, as well as free downloads of my latest three-volume book titled Obsession, as well as books on the works of individual potters. My help is always free, so if you have questions, please email me. I thank all the individuals and institutions whose images have enabled to today's peep into the past, and I thank you for watching.